My name is Charles Newth. I was drafted. <laughs> yeah, I immediately began basic training, which uh, lasted uh, 17 weeks at that time. That was a long period of uh, training. And, um, and the training was at uh, Camp Landing down in Florida, where uh, I finished uh, that, the, those 17 weeks. After I, uh, compl well, I'll tell you how it came about that I completed my basic training, was uh, I was uh, in a tent with a, with a companion. There were two of us in, in a tent. Uh, I was in with a boy from Ashtabula, Ohio, and he was a farm boy. And the two of us were in that tent uh, when the uh, first sergeant came along and he crawled into the tent and he hit me across the soles of my feet with his <laughs> stick. And he said, get your kit together. You're getting to the Army Specialized Training Program. My first stop was at Ohio State University, where uh, I sat in on chemical engineering lectures. And uh, that was a screening point uh, before I, I entered the, uh, the atom bomb project, uh, in which they were testing uh, to see uh, what uh, needs they had for specialized uh, uh, knowledge uh, or aptitude. And uh, one of those uh, was the, the atom bomb project was probably drawing more people than any of the other secret projects. When I, when I entered the project, uh, the first thing I learned was that uh, we were more secret than anything else in, in, in service. Uh, initially, uh, the idea was uh, that you were going to be told nothing except what you absolutely had to know in order to uh, operate. However, most of us had contacts immediately from college. I, I, uh, well, I was one hour on the project and I ran into men that I had known from college and they said, come over here and I'll tell you what it's all about. And that's how I learned what was going to happen. The point was that we had to uh, refine both plutonium and uranium in order to bring them to uh, uh, useful uh, concentration uh, for uh, explosives purposes. What the target was, was a uh, degree of, uh, of um, uh, vo uh, explosive uh, power that would be far beyond anything known before. I was sent first to Oak Ridge briefly in Tennessee uh, uh, and, and in order that my uh, references could be double checked before I could go any closer to the uh, beginning of uh, the, the whole uh, assignment. Then I went to Los Alamos uh, in New Mexico uh, on the uh, what they call the Pajarita Plateau, uh, uh, 7,500 feet ele elevation. Los Alamos was uh, the most uh, uh, secretive of all. Uh, we had uh, restricted uh, uniforms. Uh, uh, we just uh, were labeled uh, service forces. We had no specialized designation because uh, we were essentially um, melting into the background, uh, uh, p people, for example, could go into town, but they were not recognizable as anything other than the run-of-the-mill of service people. In, in the early testing, uh, what, what we had before us were two possibilities, well, two, two possibilities. One was what we called the uh, the uh, little boy, and the other was uh, the, um, the fat man. And they were quite different in, in their um, construction. Uh, <clears throat> the fat man was a plutonium bomb uh, in which uh, the bomb literally, and, and I held it in my hands, it was like a grapefruit. It had the dimensions of a grapefruit. And uh, it was detonated such that uh, the casing would implode and put pressure on the central um, uh, explosive, which would then evaporate everything. 
uh, the little boy was different. It was like a revolver that, that fired a bullet into a target. And in that ac action, it uh, creates the impact that detonated the bomb. The first bomb tested was the little boy, and it was done uh, in, uh, in uh, New Mexico uh, on the, um, uh, on the uh, open uh, uh, prairie. Uh, and uh, as it's well known, it was a 100-foot high steel tower with a bomb at the top. When, when the explosive was detonated, the, uh, first of all, the impression, the concussion was felt for 200 miles. And uh, the, uh, uh, the steel tower, 100 feet high, disappeared. It, it was like gas. The distance uh, that was safe uh, for testing uh, was uh, certainly calculated at, at great uh, care and with uh, uh, and such that uh, you were in a b b you were shielded from the impact. The dangers of radiation were, were serious and well re documented and explained to us, so we were aware of this. And indeed, I know of a man who lost his life in an experiment. So uh, whether there were others, I don't know, but it was a dangerous uh, game. It happened that. Uh, after the uh, first bomb uh, was detonated, and as I said, uh, uh, it was the, uh, the little boy, uh, the, the Japanese did not surrender, of course. And so I believe that we waited three days uh, before uh, dropping a second bomb, which was the Fat Man, uh, on um, Nagasaki in Japan, and that immediately, almost instantly, led to Japan's surrender. My feeling is, and I've heard this from other people as well, that uh, <clears throat> the bomb shortened the war, saved many lives, but many people feel that it was not a moral thing to do. The extent of the uh, danger and of the uh, destruction and the loss of life was so great, it was unprecedented. And many people seriously felt they were sorry they had a part in it. My name is Lawrence Kaplan. I uh, went to uh, Fort Jackson in South Carolina for basic training. And then after a while, I set up a program in the Army called the uh, Army Specialized Training Program. They sent me to uh, Lafayette College in eastern Pennsylvania. I was assigned to the Spanish program. I had to learn to speak Spanish fluently. When that program broke up at the end of about six months, they needed troops at the front. I was selected to go into military intelligence training in Camp Ritchie, Maryland. After I finished military training, they decided to select me to send me to London in England to study under British intelligence. My specialty in military intelligence were photo interpretation. In other words, planes would fly over the enemy territory, take pictures of the ground, and turn those pictures over to us to study, to evaluate, and to plot on maps any concentrations of troops, of guns, of personnel, of any kind of military information that we could use that would be helpful to us so that we don't get trapped. We know exactly what's in front of us. Well, from England, we finally got instructions to move into Normandy. 
And so we moved from Batsford, central England, down to Southampton. We got on LSTs and we moved across the English Channel into Normandy at Utah Beach. You can't land tanks on D-Day. You can't land tanks in water. You have to have a dry surface. And so we had to wait until there was a bridgehead in Normandy. So we didn't get in until about 18 days after D-Day. My division made the breakthrough in Le Say. And our goal was to get to Brest, which is at the tip point of the Brittany Peninsula. And there, of course, that was a very important submarine base that the Germans had. And we had to do everything in our power to destroy that base because that's where they, their submarines nested. And so we, we headed out. We broke through the lines. We broke through every German force that they could put in our way. And we did succeed in getting to Brest. The German army, on the other hand, had instructions that if we broke through their lines, they are to regroup and follow us to Brest and put up a last-ditch fight at Brest to protect their submarine base. And so when we got to Brest and we camped, we realized that we were surrounded by the German army. We were in deep trouble. But thank God, we looked up at the sky one morning and there came the Air Force planes and they bombed the hell out of the German troops which surrounded us. We broke a hole through their lines. We captured hundreds of Nazi prisoners. We killed several hundred Nazis. We captured the general of the German forces in Brittany and we, it was a complete success. We were down in, in central France when we got notice on December 24th, the day before Christmas, that we had to drive all night to get to Bastogne to relieve the 101st Airborne Division, which was trapped in Bastogne. It was not only my division. I don't want you to think that we won the war alone. You don't win a war by yourself. There were other tank divisions as well as ours which were called into action. The 4th Armored Division, the 6th Armored, which is my division, and about at least half a dozen more tank divisions, infantry troops, engineers, signal people, all of these people together managed to break through and free the 101st Airborne in the Battle of Ardennes. I want you also to know that it was a 6th Armored Division that liberated the Buchenwald concentration camp, which was near Weimar in Germany. What the scene that we found there was horrifying. I mean, people were dying of disease, of starvation. It was the smell. They didn't have time to bury the bodies. They were dying so rapidly. It is estimated to 58,000 Jewish people and others were killed in Buchenwald. And we liberated the camp. As soon as we got into the camp, it was our medics and thank God, they're a wonderful lot. They picked up all of the still living, still breathing, and put them on cots and transported them to military hospitals for, for redevelopment, for, for nurturing, for giving them food and drink and bringing them back to life. And we accomplished that miraculously. It was a wonderful achievement. I went through Buchenwald, you know, myself. The people don't believe what they did there to the people. I mean, they just put them into these ovens and, and burned them, burned the bodies. The stench must have been terrific in the, in the whole area. But we did indeed liberate Buchenwald, and that was our greatest achievement. It occurred on May April 11th, 1945, April 11th, and we did liberate the Buchenwald concentration camp. We pulled out every, every living soul that we could, and we put in. The Germans had already left. They shed their uniforms. They all became German peasants working farms. 
they were fighting for their lives too. War is hell. People, countries should avoid war at any expense because the loss and the dangers to life and limb of young people is so, so severe that it leaves a lifelong impression and that's, that's bad. So I would say to the younger generation, avoid war at any cost. Grosselfinger. I was commissioned a second lieutenant in the Coast Artillery Reserve, and that was in June of 1938, when I was called to active duty on Bastille Day, <laughs> July 14th, 1941. I was called into the Signal Corps because the Signal Corps was the branch that was uh, expanding the most at that time. And the, even though I was in the Coast Artillery, since I was an engineer, that made me eligible for the Signal Corps. So I reported to duty for my orders read to be released from active duty after one year. Well, after five months, Pearl Harbor happened, and my one year turned out to be five and a half, of which uh, part of it was uh, voluntary. I was in a, in a signal battalion, in fact it was the 51st, which was in continuous operation since its formation in 1917. It's still in formation now, it's overseas in Afghanistan. So I was a uh, company officer and uh, well, we were transferred down to Camp uh, Blanding in Florida in May of 43, we got orders to go to New York, and we boarded a uh, French ship, the Louis Pasteur, with a British crew, American, 5,000 American troops bound for Casablanca. But the first two days out of New York, we had air cover, which meant they were watching for U-boats. And the last two days before Casablanca, we had the same air cover. But the three days in the middle, of course, we were on our own. But we landed in Casablanca without any problems. Well, when we were in uh, North Africa, uh, one of our sergeants stepped on an anti-personnel mine on one of the pole lines we were rehabilitating. We never worked on a right away unless the engineers cleared it, but the engineers weren't 100% effective and they missed this one. So he ended up in a British hospital and we didn't expect to see him again. But to my amazement, four months later, he showed up, he was reassigned to the battalion, and the first thing he did was come to me and say, I'm here because a surgeon, in an, an over, he, he said I, he had made such a fuss at the British hospital because they intended to amputate his foot that they got rid of him. They s sent him to an American hospital where this surgeon put him in such condition I was back on duty. And he said, his name is the same as yours. And my name, Grosselfinger, was kind of unusual. So I concluded it was a cousin of mine who I had seen once in my life at my grandfather's farm in Long Island. Well, there we went uh, east of Tunisia and finally came back to Mers el Kabir, which is the port of Oran, Algeria, on our way to uh, Italy. Now we landed in Naples. We were on our way ultimately to Rome, but uh, there was really a stalemate at the Gustav line that was about near Casino where things really bogged down. That was about 40 miles north of Naples. And there was an interesting experience there. 
We built these pole lines, you know, a pole line with a telephone pole, cross arms, glass insulators to which the copper wire was attached. Well, every, once, every in, interval we had a maintenance team to make repairs in case of a storm, a tree falling on a wire, uh, vehicle hitting a pole and so on. And these maintenance teams came out to, if there was a break, 